So uh, let me just write that down as a title. Um, I'm going to put quotation marks because one thing that I kind of dislike that a lot of, not a lot, some people do, some people not in physics do, is this just the number arbitrary things, seven habits of highly effective people, why seven, why not eight, why not five, three? It's all arbitrary. And laws of physics are usually not numbered that way. They are usually numbered in a very strict way and we minimize the number of laws we need. Uh, which is another reason I don't <laughs> like all those additional laws of thermodynamics. Um, so here I'm going to put quotation mark because uh, these conductor properties that I'm numbering, it is arbitrary. <laughs> don't expect anyone else to use the same numbering. I'm just uh, enumerating it so that you're aware there are these um, specific things about conductors that are good to know. So conductor property with a quotation marks. And we are going to need to use certain properties. The biggest one, well, I guess the number one is the what I had labeled the conductive property number three, which was, I could say it as the surface of a conductor defines an equipotential surface, but I think that's a little bit more limiting because um, I think that's sufficient, but Really, the full thing is um, all the connected parts of a conductor are at the same electric potential. So, um, and uh, this uh, is uh, derived or explained in um, uh, multiple different places and this uh, property follows from the fact that under electrostatic equilibrium, by the way, all of these are under electrostatic equilibrium. Once we go outside of that, then don't rely on these properties anymore. <laughs> so, so that under electrostatic equilibrium, electric field is zero inside the conductor. Then you can get this property as an application of this fact and uh, the definition of electric potential, which is defined in a way similar to potential energy through line integral of a vector field. <laughs> so, but this is uh, the pl starting place for us here. And the, the thing I would like to drive or the situation I would like to investigate is let's say we have two conductors, uh, one of one radius, R1, one of another radius, R2, where R2 is greater than R1. We connect these two electrically. This is a conducting wire. So, um, so, so that all the, the conditions I was putting here is satisfied that this entire thing can be considered as one conductor. And really what we are doing this as an example of is imagine a weirdly shaped conductor, like if this conductor, then it has a part with a different curvature. It has this part with a relatively large radius of curvature, and it has this part of tape, where the radius of curvature is uh, small. And uh, you know, dealing with this arbitrary shape, that is difficult, we are not doing that. So what we are doing is uh, using this as a model that is simple enough to analyze so that we can get some general well, rule of thumb <laughs> that uh, that's applicable in a wide variety of situations without being quantitatively too exact. So, so I want to analyze this setup. And um, as we are analyzing it, what we are ultimately interested in are the uh, properties of electric field in this setup. So, um, so let me just state it. What do electric fields look like in this setup? And I want to point out some pitfalls that I want you to avoid or, or I want you to recognize and you know, not fall into the pit. <laughs> So here are some naive thinking analysis that'll allow you to that may allow you to draw 
mistaken conclusions, which actually in this context might be right, but you arrive at it in a mistaken way, so it's still wrong. <laughs> um, which is uh, not also one very easy mistake to make is the naive application of Coulomb's law. You have this formula memorized. Electric field of a point or even a sphere is equal to Coulomb constant times charge over R squared. So this is the naive mistake you can fall into. You look at these radii and you think, yeah, the electric field goes as one over R squared. So of course, when the R is smaller, then electric field is stronger. So you conclude that when you look at electric field here, for example, and you look at electric field here, for example, and you conclude, yes, of course, E1 is greater than E2. Now, this inequality itself is not wrong, <laughs> but the reasoning process that went into it is wrong. Because for that reasoning process to be valid, what had to be true is that the amount of charge on both of these spheres had to be the same, and they are not. They are not the same. Um, and you know, nothing in the setup actually forces them to be the same. So it shouldn't surprise you that the amount of charge that's on this smaller sphere is not the same amount of charge as on this larger sphere. Um, then you might now go the other way too much where you say, oh, so this larger sphere, it probably has more charge. So because it has more charge, this, um, the electric field here is going to be greater. Maybe. <laughs> it could be. It turns out not to be. So what we instead have to do here is instead of being sidetracked by all the things we don't know, and frankly misapplying this formula, let me erase it, rely on the things that you do know. And the thing that you do know is um, Oh, this is such a misleading label. <laughs> the thing that you do know is the conductor property number three. This is um, this is not the conductor property number four. This is the conductor um, property number three. <laughs> so that is a property that you know, which means you can say this. If uh, the surface of this conductor is at some voltage V naught, you can say the surface of this conductor here is also at the voltage V naught. That is the quantity that is being held a constant. And this is a feature that uh, feature in physics problem solving and possibly other problems of quantitative problem solving that you're going, going to see over and over, which is you have some relationship which relates multiple quantities and usually three or more dynamical quantities. And you have to know something additional about the setup beyond that relationship to fix one of those three quantities so that you can talk about uh, how the, the remaining two are related to each other. And this is exactly a setup like that because with that electric field, radius, and charge, that formula for the electric field of sphere, you had the three dynamical quantities. So you, you needed a way to fix one of them. Now it turns out <laughs> with that particular relationship, you don't have a way to fix any of them. So give up on that. <laughs> what you can instead use here is, um, is this conductor property number three. And uh, I will demonstrate how we can use this to conclude correctly that the electric field right outside this sphere is greater than the electric field right outside this sphere. So um, let me move the question over so that I have some space to write stuff. This is the electric field of a sphere, um, a spherical charge distribution. It's a, it can be actually any spherically symmetric charge distribution. For the simplicity's sake, I can say it's the spherical shell, electric field of a spherical shell. The magnitude of that electric field is given by Coulomb constant times the charge on the spherical shell divided by the distance squared. That's the Coulomb's law. And we talked about how we, using Gauss's law, we can drive that. 
Now, using this expression and using the definition of a voltage, which uh, maybe I should have written it down here, definition of voltage, change in voltage is equal to minus the electric field times the, 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 the dot product of electric field and displacement. This um, should remind you of the work done by conservative force. <laughs> so using the definition of voltage, we can derive an expression for voltage of a spherical shell. So voltage of a spherical shell is given by this. And this is under a very specific convention, which I'll write down right after I write down the formula. The formula for this is the Coulomb constant times the charge divided by R. And, and there's you know, slight distinction between the two, whereas the electric field is a vector quantity, voltage or electric potential is a scalar quantity. It's like energy, it doesn't have direction. And um, this particular expression, it depends on this uh, convention, which is that voltage as a function of R goes to zero as the R goes to infinity. It has to do with the fact that uh, whenever you set potential energy, it's always the potential energy difference that's meaningful. So as far as the reference point goes, you know, where do you set the voltage or potential or potential energy to be equal to zero? That's an arbit that's potentially arbitrary choice. But this particular choice, you see me defending it in the lecture as a universal reference uh, reference point. So that's the convention we are using. Under the convention, this is the formula. So, so okay, I, I think now I have everything here. So this is the set of expressions I can write down. Let me, let me try to organize my expressions in terms of ones that relate to the larger sphere. So the R1 sphere, um, and the expressions that relate to the smaller sphere, R2 sphere. So I can talk about the, the voltage on the sphere. Voltage on surface. Both have a voltage of V0. That is what we are keeping constant. Um, and I can rewrite each of these expressions using this formula here. So I don't actually know how much it charges on each of those spheres. So, so I'll leave that as a variable and write this down. On the R1 sphere, let's say there's a charge Q1 at a distance of R1. And this uh, expression is equal to V0. And for our R2, um, that's the voltage. And that's the, this formula still remains valid. I just uh, had to be sure to use <laughs> Q2 and R2. Coulomb constant times Q2 over R2. So this is the expression for voltage um, at the surface of this um, uh, conducting sphere. And because of the conductor proper number three, these two things happen to be equal to each other. Okay, um, let me just close that off there. And let's uh, try looking at the electric field on surface. You have to be careful here. It's the electric field just outside the conductor, not inside or whatever. Then here, you know, I don't know the value of the electric field. So I would like to start out with the formula. So starting with the formula, it's going to be um, the Coulomb constant times the amount of charge, Q1 divided by R1 squared. And I'll leave that at just the magnitude. I'm not going to worry about the vector portion. So, and I can write down the same expression for R2, Coulomb constant times Q2 divided by R2 squared. Now, I hope you begin to see some very um, useful substitutions that can be made that simplifies on the algebra and frankly saves time. Um, so let me make that obvious. I'm going to factor out one factor of one over R1 there, one over R1. And so to factor that out, I get rid of one factor there. And same thing here, factor out one over R2. 
erase that there. Oops. So this combination of expressions here, that is this. This combination of expressions here, that is this. So I can make the substitution and end up with the expression for the electric field outside of this rounder sphere. And I get V0 over R1. Over here, I get V0, same V0 over R2. So these are the, so these are the expressions for the electric field that um, outside here, E1. Uh, this is the expression for electric field E2 outside the smaller sphere. And it's on this basis, you can say E2 is greater than E1. And note how the factor by which E2 is greater is smaller than it would have been otherwise. The, in, under the first naive analysis, you would have said, let's say if the ratio of the radii are factor of two, if this uh, radius is half as large as this one, you would have said, oh, electric field, they are different by a factor of four. But that would be wrong. <laughs> the relationship is linear because the amount of charge on these spheres are different. There is a smaller amount of charge here, but it's not such a smaller amount that it causes electric field uh, to be smaller than it is here. So, so that's the conductor property number four. Let me write that out explicitly, which is erasing this conductor property number three. Conductor property number four. So this can only really be stated in a qualitative way because this particular example is a deliberately simple example where we could analyze it in detail. Um, so conductor property number four, the way we qualitatively state it is electric field outside uh, charge the conductor. And I probably should qualify it as um, electro in an electrostatic equilibrium, although I think a, a good chunk of this whole holds true when it's not equilibrium. So inside so the charge of the conductor in an electrostatic equilibrium um, is greatest or is greatest or greater. Let me say is greater. Is greater around sharper corners. Um, sharper corners. Or if you think that uh, a little bit too, I don't know, terribly informal because what I mean by sharper corners, it's not very, um, um, it's not very um, rigorous <laughs> way to state it. It's not very mathematical. You could say um, instead of sharper corners, that's one way to say it. Um, around the, the, the other way would be around the surfaces with smaller radius of curvature, which is the mathematically precise way to say sharper corners. Um, any kind of continuous surface, you can imagine fitting a sphere to it and the sphere that will be tangent there. Um, and I guess tangent is where the, the, the derivative is the same and where the second derivative is the same, that's where you have the same radius of curvature. Um, so you can associate that measure with uh, electric field strength. And because uh, for arbitrary conductor shapes, it depends on the exact shape. We don't have a formula for it, but we can say that when I have a conductor that looks like this, electric field is gonna be strongest here. Um, and that's why with the electric world demo, you see it spinning the way it spins because the, where the ionization has to happen is at the tip of those, um, those arms where it's been deliberately sharpened. So let's conduct a property for. Uh, 